Hello, I'm Chloe Tilly. Welcome to this Google Hangout brought to you by BBC World. We're live on the BBC News YouTube channel. You can watch us for the next 30 minutes. We're going to be discussing sexism and who is to blame. It's all part of the 100 women season here at the BBC. If you're watching live, you can see down the side of the screen um, that we have a live Q&A. If you want to get involved over the next 30 minutes, that is the best way to do it. But so many of you have been getting in touch on Facebook, on Twitter over the last 24 hours or so with questions which I'm going to put to our guests. They're here with us now. You can see the four women on the screen with me and they're each going to introduce themselves. They're going to give us an idea of who is to blame for sexism. Is it men? Is it women? Do they have a role in this? Is it society? Is it lawmakers? Well, let's uh, have um, an introduction first of all from our guest in Egypt. Hi, uh, my name is Dua Abdelayel. I am um, I can I call myself a feminist and I'm a women's rights advocate. I'm also a, a board member uh, of the National Solidarity Network of Women Living on a Muslim Nose. Okay, and let's go next to our guest who's in Mexico. Hello, I am uh, Gisela from Mexico. I am a lawyer and a specialist in women's rights and digital rights. And I am part of this um, high-impact protest group named Femin. Well, welcome to this Hangout. Let's go to Vienna now. Hi, I'm Susan Tahmasebi. I'm an Iranian women's rights activist and an Iranian-American. Um, I am the co-founder of the International Civil Society Action Network. It's a um, US-based nonprofit with global programs. And finally to Thailand. Yeah, uh, Shalita Pan, Song Sampan, teaching political science, uh, feminist uh, theory, and also politics of sexuality at Thammasa University in Bangkok, Thailand. Well, a warm welcome to all of you. And I want to speak to Dua first, but I'm keen for you all to chip in as we go along. Dua, I know that you were very much involved in the Arab Spring. So I wonder if you yourself have experienced a lot of sexism in Egypt. Maybe you could share some experiences with us. Well, um, I have to say it's it's part of our, our daily life. Uh, it's not because of what's so called the Arab Spring, but because it's it's actually how we go through the day as women and some of the most most of the time as men as well. So, so it's it's not it's. It's part of what we face every day, uh, from what we have to do and what we have to wear and where to to, to walk and how to walk. It's, it's actually contributing to shaping our daily life. Like for example, I would like uh, for 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 us women here in in Egypt, like simple practices that might be usual in many places, like riding bicycles or um, running down the street for uh, half an hour out of workout or something like this. These are the small simple things that is, are not expected from women uh, to do or to practice in their daily life. So you can, you can imagine that is how we, how we go uh, on a daily basis. It's also also for men themselves, is what is expected from them, how they are obviously, what color even to go to their clothes or how they are, their outfit. So it's yeah, basically contributing to very small things uh, in our, how we, how we choose our wardrobe for the day to, you can imagine, up to everything, politics and lawmaking. So well, before I want to go to, to um, one of our other contributors to get their personal experiences, I'm interested. You say that you know women it's frowned upon to ride bikes. Even men have to think about what they wear. If people go outside of those norms, what's the penalty? Uh, I wouldn't call it a penalty, but you would get um, from verbal harassment to physical harassment because. It's, we have to see the whole picture. Sexism is part of all these power practices. So the society practice huge power against individuals on our everyday life. So if you are a woman riding a bike 
big impact. As someone realizes that you are a woman, you can get uh, from uh, cars, uh, uh, people driving cars, shouting at you that you have to take the sidewalk, and to people actually pushing you. Uh, so it's it's a kind it's part of the practicing of how people sh refuse that you are in the, in the out there and doing something that is that, that the society doesn't see uh, normal or acceptable. Uh, well, so stay with us because I want to. I want to bring in uh, Susan now, who is an Iranian American. I wonder what experiences you've had because that's two very different cultures that you've bridged. Sure. I mean, I think sexism actually cuts across cultures. It's a, a common and common and phenomenon and a common experience, regardless regardless of your culture. And I, you know, I want to point to some societal structural issues that bring to light the issue of sexism. For example, in my country, Iran, we still have very strict gender codes that are codified in law um, that promote discrimination against women, but also require of men that they have, they play out very strict gender roles. Now, in the U.S. as well, we have something very similar. I mean, it's, it's played out in a different way, but still there are very strict gender roles that, um, that, 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 that women's groups have been fighting for a long time. I know in the 80s when I first came to the US, the issue of domestic violence was a contested issue, right? When women faced domestic violence, they were told by police to go home. So this is something that, you know, even in the US, it's an issue that has been dealt with more recently. And currently in the US, just as in Iran, women's rights to their bodies and their reproductive health rights are contested rights. So there are a lot of similarities. We have, you know, we have progress um, in in some areas, in some contexts, but not in others. So I think it's a common experience among women and among men um, across countries, you know, in the West, in the East. And I think that it's something that both men and women can can relate to, no matter where they're from, because gender roles cut across cultures, even if they're played out a little bit differently. Well, let's bring in Hazela, who's in Mexico. Can you identify with anything you've heard there from your perspective in Mexico? Yeah, I mean, I really like what um, Susana said, that sexism c cuts across cultures. I think it's true in different degrees. Um, in my experience, well, I, I like to talk more about gender more than than sex. I don't know, because it, it like this gender discrimination, these roles that are like constructed, it's kind of the same thing, but I think it's worth it to make the, the, like the, the, the distinction. And um, for me, in these gender roles, in these roles that you're supposed to follow, they are oppressive because they don't let you be who you want to be, whatever, however you want to assume yourself. And for me, my experience is it's twofold. First, that I grew up in a very conservative Catholic environment. Um, it's called the Legionaries of Christ. And it's one of the most powerful um, legions in, in Mexico. They have a lot of money and they have a lot of power with the state. And eventually, when the founder founder died, um, they knew that he had um, like he raped a lot of children and all these like church scandals and all this. So I grew up in that um, like very conservative environment where gender roles are educated. They are not questioned, but they are imposed upon. So you you have to marry a virgin, you have to cook, you have to be a mother even if you don't want to, um, no abortion because it's a, like a capital sin, and overall this notion of prudency that reminds me of what Doa said, right? Cover yourself, your body is a source of sin for men. So, and afterwards I became an activist of feminine, and what we do is topless protest um, to show that to try to show that the body is not erotic itself, but it can have artistic or political connotations. And it strikes me how people in Mexico react overall. I mean, all over the world, but Mexico is my country. And it's, for one side, a lot of aggression from people in general, I'm not even saying men. And from the other, it's um, the erotization of my body, even if I want it to be political, and even if I conceive it to be political when I protest. I want to bring in um, Chalidaporn, who is in Thailand, because I wonder if there's a more modest interpretation of feminism in Thailand. When you hear about that feminine in um, Mexico, whether Thailand has a different approach to it. 
uh, uh, let me put it this way. I think I agree with all of uh, our panelists today that uh, these gender differences affect our social lives uh, uh, in, in almost uh, every culture on this planet. But uh, gender also manifests itself uh, differently. So it's, it, it is quite nice to compare and uh, the sexism can, can uh, express itself in a very subtle way. So uh, when we talk about this uh, harassment in uh, uh, the women in Egypt, so many women in Egypt or maybe in Iran or, or some other uh, parts of the world experience, this uh, harassment can, can come in the form of verbal harassment. Uh, uh, let me just use myself as an example. I am a middle class woman teaching in the, uni in the university. So most form of harassment I have been facing in my life is verbal. So sometimes it's very uh, difficult to point out to people. That's why when uh, we talk about sexism, so many uh, BBC viewers might think that uh, this is so outdated because you cannot perceive it as sexism or you cannot perceive it as a harassment uh, or this discrimination or devaluation to some other people based on genders. I can see one question which has come in as we discuss this. I can read it off the screen um, above me. It's well known fact that males and females have distinctive differences in all branches of science from genetics, anatomy and psychology. Today, why do we have the desire for equality when both sexes clearly have major and inherent differences? Lyndon Lee has posted that. I wonder who wants to pick up on that point. Susan, why don't oh. you go? <laughs> well, um, uh, yes, of course, there are biological differences between, you know, the sexes, um, but uh, gender roles are socially constructed, and gender inequality is also a social con construct. Um, there shouldn't be um, discrimination against one, one gender or one sex based on the biological differences, and there's nothing to prove that, you know, women have less capacities than men do, or that... Um, that people cannot choose their own identities, their own gender identities based on social construct. I mean, I think that, you know, this is an old argument. Um, the fact that somebody raises it shows that there is actually inherent, there's, there's so much sexism that um, and there's a great need for awareness. Um, but I don't think that biological differences should be the basis of discrimination against people. I would like to say something, if it's Absolutely. possible. Um, I think um, that's why sexism and racism have so much in common. It's like saying that black people are inferior because of a biological threat. Of course, there are biological differences, but they are not relevant in terms of equality and enough capacities. They are more socially constructed, as Susan, as Susan said. So, um, I mean, I just want to point that. Like saying that men and women have inherent genetic and, and, I don't know, psychological differences is the same as saying that black men or, or Asian men or Mexican men or whatever are, are different and I just I really don't agree in that. But there is a fact isn't it that um, if for example there's a job that involves lifting that I as a five foot four quite slim woman would not be able to lift as much as a big bulky six foot seven guy and maybe that that's just fact isn't it? I mean we got one comment in here on um, the World Have Your Say Facebook page from Chia who is a man in the UK and says let me tell you my experience I work in the UK mainly working in a bakery a normal worker and I'm on the same wages regardless of sex and whether I'm a good worker or not I get a rise but the delivery of bags of flour, etc., only the men carry the heavy sacks, and that is my experience of sexism. But I don't think I'd be able to carry a heavy sack. So is that sexism if I'm not allowed to carry it? Do I need a choice? I, I think it's quite different. Uh, it's quite different between this ability, this physical ability, and the way we value those abilities or the differences. So uh, some men might be able to carry heavy stuff, but uh, many men cannot. And, uh, and, it might, and it's also true uh, among women too. So, so the point here is not about biological differences itself, but it's, it's the way we value or devalue certain characteristics or uh, 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 certain uh, bio biological traits that men and women or male and female have uh, in, in, in each society. Stuart, do you want to pick up on this? Um, and if I may, may I come in? Yes. It's also, why is it always when we talk about sexism is we talk about physical ability? 
like this is this is the the the, the entry point to talk about how women can uh, lift heavy things and or, or how men can lift heavy things while women cannot do. I'm so, I'm so sorry. This is like very. I mean, I don't know how to describe it, but. But why is it only this is the, the point of discussion? But there are other things that women are are able to do that also men cannot do. And men can do things that women cannot. Like, why do we have to put all this type of segregation? Like, men can do this, women cannot do that. Because it's, it's, in, it's supposed, when we talk about a society, it's supposed to be integrated roles. It's not like I can do this, you cannot do this. I can go to medicine school for a woman. There is lots of structural, there is lots of um, obstacles that the society puts in front of a man and a woman that they cannot go. Like for example, when I talk from my context, where where I come, like simple acts, like people, for example, oh, we are not expecting men to cry in public, but uh, we can expect this for a woman. This is like like suppressing certain people from doing like a simple act of crying or laughing or moving around and to like this is what I was saying minimal minimal acts. So why is it always about physical ability? Because I'm yeah, I mean, if if we like if we are going to make this comparison, women deliver babies, which is one of the painful experiences around yeah, I mean, all all over yeah, I mean, when it comes to body. But men and, and cannot do this. So I mean, what, the physical ability is one of the things that we like need to, to 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 assess to assess. But it's not. It hasn't doesn't have to be always the entry point. Do well, I'm interested because you talked about obstacles put in the place of women by society. You obviously see that society has a role in this. I just wonder who else thinks that the problems experienced by women with regards sexism is down to society or down to something else. Susan, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think that society plays a big role. These are prescribed gender roles. Sometimes, depending on the context, they can be very strict. I'll give you an example that I was talking to. A, a few friends the other day, and we were talking about a friend of ours, a woman who has a very, who's a very successful woman in her work, and because of the situation in their family, her husband is the stay-at-home husband who takes care of her small child, and it was, even though I was speaking to people who were very enlightened, it became a matter of a joke that he was, that he was staying home. So sexism is not something that just impacts women. It impacts men as well, and I think Doa said, um, we can't really talk about the biological, we can't only be limited by the biological differences. I think feminism and fighting against sexism is about giving people choices so that they can have opportunities, they can have equal opportunities, and um, they are able to make a variety of choices that are not pre uh, prescribed by our society. Um, and you know, we're living in a rapidly changing world. And I think that it's time that um, we really re-examined some of these very strict gender roles that say men are supposed to do this and women are supposed to do that and allow people to make life choices that are best suited for them. Gisela, in Mexico, what's your perspective on who puts these obstacles in the way of women? Do you think it's down to society? Do you think women, in some ways, don't help themselves? I think it has a lot to do on education mainly, and that goes through um, inst all, every, almost every institution, like even the state where women have been uh, shut off for, for a lot of years until now we're kind of uh, getting even. And religion definitely for me it's a big factor, uh, especially for what I lived, and family roles um, and education. And then I asked myself the question and in a very... Um, controversial but uh, um, actual uh, subject, what, are, what is the role of feminism? Because I think everything is said, well, there's over a hundred years that we've been working on this, there's theory, there's practice, there's philosophy, there's deconstruction, there's books, but how are we communicating them to a generation of millennials that get informed through the internet? And that's why um, Emma Watson and Beyonce and all these uh, pop feminist um, um, like statements have had a lot of impact, even if they are not as deep and they are not as thorough as they could be on gender deconstruction, but I ask myself that question. 
if it's all about education, if media plays a big part in all of this, if advertising plays a big part, how are we going to use all that to communicate a message that is an eye-opener, truly? I wish I knew feminism before in my life. I'm interested you talk about Beyonce and feminism in the same breath. We recently did a program on World Have Your Say on BBC World Service Radio, talking about whether she could actually be a feminist when she's a woman standing there very scantily clad, um, shaking herself around when she's dancing. And is that a new breed of feminism, or is that actually setting women's causes back? Um, I think it is a breed of feminism, of course. It's, it, it was the whole discussion of the third wave of feminism. There is feminists that embrace themselves as sexual beings, and they enjoy it, and that's what she says, and she vindicates that. And I think it's fine, because why can men be sexual subjects and women can't? It's also another brand. I think any anything could can be feminist as long as it, it's made in conscience. And we as feminists, um, it's better if we don't judge other types of feminism because it's just as oppressive as the regime we're denouncing. Lots of people getting in touch with us. Kitty Phillips has got in touch from Florida. She has said that educating women is the only way to make the world change. But Kawisha, and I'm scared to say this, ladies, because I don't think you're going to like what he's saying, in Zambia, says that the problem is you can't change sexism. Talking about it will just cause more and more sexism. Is there a problem that if women shout incredibly loud about this, they actually put men's backs up and put the cause back? Chalidapon, I wonder what you think from Thailand. Uh, I, I think I think uh, it, it might not be just shouting, but but the fact that we uh, bring up these issues, we are willing to debate, we are willing to kind of like uh, argue or uh, uh, give some examples and these uh, experiences of uh, people, and and we just exchange these ideas. It's going to change sexism itself. I, I believe that you know talking can change things because you bring up the issues, and people cannot avoid that. People have to address that. Uh, although it's kind of like so annoying for many people when we talk about this issue of gender, sexuality, sexism and everything, but they cannot just uh, deny it. And, and uh, let me just remind you that, uh, uh, let remind all of us that uh, sexism can, uh, might be just an uh, 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 annoying experience for many people, but, but it can affect uh, this livelihood of so many women in this world. So I uh, just bring up the issue, talking about it, discuss, discussing about it among your friends uh, on social media and everything can change the world. And, and of course, education. Education will, will, will help too. Yeah, Susan, and I wonder on your... Sorry, you wanted to come in anyway, Suzanne. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to agree. I think that talking about it and actually awareness raising, having discussions about this are absolutely key. They're key to breaking gender stereotypes, to making people think differently than what's been prescribed and what they've been told you know, by the state, by society, by their parents and schools, by the church or you know, by religion. It's, it's important. And seeing how other people are living differently, how they're going beyond prescribed gender roles or how maybe gender roles differ in different societies are absolutely key to that awareness raising. But I want to bring this other point that I don't think it's just the job of women to challenge sexism. I think sexism and gen prescribed gender roles, very strict gender roles, and we see this, you know, in different different areas of the world. I mean, gender roles can be they're not they're not as strict, they're not they're more fluid, but in some places they're 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 very strict. And I think it's not just the job of women uh, to redefine gender roles and to have this conversation, but it's the, the you know it's the responsibility of both men and women. And I'm very happy to see that this is changing with the younger generation. We have a lot of men as well who are challenging traditional gender roles and and having a conversation about it. And I think social media actually helps this process. It connects people across cultures, across countries, um, where they can have a free flow of exchange of ideas. And um, so I, I just want to point that it's not just the responsibility of women to do this, but it's all of our responsibilities. Well, Susan, it's interesting that you raise that point because um, Akbari has got in touch with BBC Persian. He's from Iran and he says, how can I have a role in the eradication of sexism as a man? So what can men do? If they're watching thinking, OK, I'd like to help, but what can one person do? Susan, what would you say they should do? Well, I mean, I think people can make a, make a change, first of all, in their personal relationships, in their personal lives, right? They can, especially men, I mean, they can, they can 
um, begin where there's discrimination, if discrimination is embedded in the law, if it's embedded in society against women, particularly because women do suffer more from discrimination based on sexual, dif you know, sex differences, biological differences, they can begin to change that. They can treat their mothers, their sisters, their spouses, their friends more equally, right? So that's, that's one level. But they can also try to advocate for changes at a societal level. And I'll give you an example. In Iran, there's been this spate of acid attacks against women. There's a suspicion. It's not a proven suspicion, but it's a suspicion that it's tied to the way that women dress, that women who are perceived as not being veiled enough or not dressing appropriately are, are the subjects of this um, violence. And it's, a ter it's terrible violence. It's acid in the face, which just destroys people's sight, their faces. And this has happened in Isfahan, which is a very conservative city in Iran. It's a religiously conservative city. And just yesterday, a large number of people took to the streets. And seeing the videos, I saw that there were a lot of men in those videos demanding equality and safety and security for women from this kind of violence. And so for me, it's, it was incredibly moving to see this. And it was incredibly moving to see it that it's happening in a city that's traditionally a very conservative city and to see so many men out there condemning this kind of violence. So I think that people can make changes at the personal level in their personal relationships and they can also demand societal and legal changes as well and it's the responsibility of both men and women. Dua, I want to bring you back in in Egypt because uh, Majid has got in touch um, uh, with BBC Arabic saying in nearly all Arab countries societies are very male dominated which marginalizes women and people who followed the events of the Arab Spring will be all too familiar with the number of women who were assaulted by groups of men during those protests. What do you think needs to change in Egypt to give women a greater voice and break down that sexism? Well, um, yeah, basically many things <laughs> need to change, and I wouldn't, Yani, I would be a liar that that to say that change can happen overnight or over a day. Yeah, I I know that people keep referring to the Arab Spring and the uprising and women on the front line, all of these like pictures, international media coverage, and all of these things. But I have to say all the time that women in my country and all over the Arab-speaking uh, uh, region, they were there, they were outside and on the front and trying to uh, defend their rights all the time and change this society to more equal and free society. So we've been there, we have been there as women and, and as men who, and different genders who, who who believe in on all of these changes. But what we need to change all the time first is that to actually amplify the voices that is requesting change and equality. Because sometimes it's so easy that those voices are overlooked and cited and no one is, is, is hearing them or um, um, paying attention. So amplifying these voices, and this is what is good about social media is that it's really gave space for people to talk. But even in this space, we also find sexism and people trying to shut down the voices of women and men asking for all these equal places. And I have to say, some of these voices are not men only. They are also <coughs> women who are the gatekeeper and the safeguard of the value, the what's so-called the values of the society, which which honestly speaking, at some point I don't know what are these values they are talking about. You talk about you talk about social media and I mean social media does have a role of course you say there that it's breaking down barriers but many people be aware that all too often women get seriously abused online there have been rape threats death threats death threats many trolling cases here in the UK and in other countries around the world where people seem to think that on social media because it's not face to face they can say exactly what they like Hisela in Mexico do you think social media can move things forward or do you think in some ways it's almost a hindrance I was going to comment on that actually I think this social media is um, it's an illusion the, the thing that social media is going to liberate us because of two things First, um, it, it, it creates an atmosphere where things are emptier. My generation and younger, we consume images and we consume 140 characters on Twitter. And that's it. Our, our news uh, feed, feedback it comes from Facebook. 
So our world is actually getting smaller through social media. I'm quite a pessimist on that. And on the other side, uh, this, um, this uh, anonymity that you're talking about, people that are anonymous can get more harassed. And there are studies that show that women actually um, get more sexually harassed online than men. So there's an actual, um, uh, uh, another type of sexism there. And just to comment very quickly on what Susan and Doa had said, had said, I think what is ridiculous itself is a category of men and women. Because there is transsexual people, there is gay men, gay women, and the whole point is how we conceive ourselves to be and how we want ourselves to be independently of what sex we were born in. I think that's the first oppression. So instead of talking about responsibilities of men and women, it's responsibilities of people in general, I think. And I want to cross over to Thailand. Time is right up against us, but I want to get a final thought from Chalidaporn about what you think the way forward is. Do you think social media has got a role, or do you think there's another way to tackle this? Oh, we, we have to accept that social media uh, uh, might benefit some of us because it uh, provides us this space and also the way people can connect, exchange ideas, information, and also uh, maybe talk about their own experiences. So it's good this way, but at the same time, uh, because of this uh, anonymity, people can be so mean, people can be so violent, and people can express things the way that they are not um, uh, they, they, can, they cannot do it in uh, the offline uh, uh, situations. So uh, social media helps, but at the same time, we, we, also, um, we must, must also acknowledge uh, these uh, dangers that might come with uh, the way people use social media. So but what, um, what I, I uh, just uh, want to suggest here is it is good to provide the space for people to uh, talk to each other and at the same time if we want to change the sexism we must be able to point out when uh, some people made some kind of the sexist remarks or uh, when we uh, uh, kind of like observe these sexist beliefs that might uh, be the basis of so many policies of the states and everything. So uh, if we are going to blame something for sexism, it's all of us. So uh, the change must begin uh, with all of us too. And that seems like a positive note to end this Google Hangout on. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Suzanne, who is joining us there, also Hisela, uh, Chiledaporn, as you heard, and finally Dua, who was in Egypt. Carry on talking about this across social media, Facebook and Twitter. And thanks ever so much for watching this from BBC World. Thank you.